still proud of some of the things I did after I escaped from the vault. I told myself it was necessary to survive in the wasteland, but that wasn't really true. And some of the people I stole from needed the things I stole a lot more than I did. I never killed anyone, but that doesn't make me a good person. I think I need to make some amends, but I'll be back soon, I promise. Hey, this is Jeff, and welcome back to Fallout 3 Pacifism and More. Luce has been having a crisis of conscience since discovering Oasis. She wants to come clean with some people she let down so she can truly be at peace here. You might say she's turning over a new leaf. But um, psh. Hey, now that I have something to atone for, I can really get into character. It's like method acting. Anyway, the first item on that agenda is in Rivet City. I broke a promise to someone and I'd like to buy back the violin for 300 caps. It takes Moxie to admit you've done something wrong. I admire that. I'd be glad to sell it back to you. Here you go. If you sell the violin and get it back, there's no way to lie and pretend you brought it straight here from Vault 92. But that's okay, because Luce was going to confess anyway. I wanted to let you know I sold the Stradivarius to someone else. You son of a bitch! You know what that thing meant to me? It was a family heirloom. It belonged rightfully in the hands of a musician. Someone to appreciate its value, not to exploit it. I can't believe you'd stab an old woman in the back like this. Now get out. Get out of here this instant. Fortunately, she doesn't aggro, but you are locked out of any more dialogue with her unless you get the violin back. Hmm. Hmm. What's that you're carrying? Is it something else to taunt me with? I totally deserve that. But I didn't just come here to tell you I sold it. I came to tell you I got it back. Here's your violin. You actually got it back. I didn't think you'd bother after that stunt you pulled. It's like holding a piece of history in the palm of my hands. Amazing. Simply amazing. It may have been like pulling teeth, but at least you finally brought me the thing. Still, I'm lacking a suitable reward for what you've done. All I can give you is the frequency to my radio set. Tune in whenever you feel like listening to the strains of an old woman's violin playing. Sadly, we will not be listening to that because of copyright trolls. I have to go now. Come back soon. The karma you get for that is the same as if you completed the quest by giving it to her, but Luce has done a couple big ticket negative karma things recently, so yes, we are still neutral. Next on the agenda, it's time to tell Elder Lyons that the Enclave stole the Gek. All I'm saying is, the longer we sit here, the more time they have to shore up their defenses. We should hit them sooner rather than later. We barely have the manpower to keep the Citadel fortified. We've been over this before, Sarah. So we just wait until they decide we're next on the list? If the Pride goes in now, we might have a chance. And if you fail, then what? The risk is not worth the reward. I agree. Without the Gek, the Purifier is useless to the Enclave anyway. They may give up before long. I don't like it. You don't have to like it, Sarah. You just have to follow orders. Yes, Father. So, you're back. We had feared both you and the Gek were lost. Were you successful? Well, sort of. I found the Gek. Excellent. With that, we hold the key to keeping the Enclave from controlling the Purifier. Yeah. The Enclave took the Gek. They're, well, they probably have it installed by now. Then we must go at once. If you have any other information, tell me now before we mobilize. Any help you can give might save lives. If you convince Eden to self-destruct, you also get an option to tell him Raven Rock is destroyed, but we didn't, so it's not. Now, I'm certainly not the first person to comment on this. In fact, I might have commented on it during the Quo Vagis playthrough. But you only get to tell him one of these things, and then another cutscene starts. Which seems very odd, because he just scolded Sarah for wanting to run off and fight without good intel and a plan, so why wouldn't he want a thorough debrief now? Especially since most of what you can tell him actually makes the situation at least slightly less urgent. I mean, Luz would love to explain that the Enclave can't start the Purifier, or she would have told him what happened right away. And he would absolutely want to know that some of the Enclave forces are fighting each other. 
Ditto for knowing their HQ is destroyed if it was. But her top priority has to be getting rid of the FEV, and that's the one choice that at least vaguely makes sense that he might think the situation is more dire. Eden wanted me to sabotage the project with some kind of virus. I see. And where is this virus now? I have it here. Take it. Thank you. I'll see to it that it's disposed of properly once the scribes have had time to analyze it. Perhaps we have underestimated the Enclave. Sarah may be right. An attack may be necessary now. If the Enclave has the Gek, there's nothing stopping them from starting the Purifier. They'll figure out the code eventually. I'm afraid you're right. We need to act now while we can. Send the Pride in. We can do it. We can win this. All right, Sarah. The Pride goes in. But I want them to have some extra firepower. Rothschild, is it ready? What? No, I, I mean, Lee and I have solved the power problems, but we've only barely finished diagnostic tests. So? It's not ready for field tests, let alone live fire situations. The weapons haven't been calibrated, the navigation detection system is offline. Rothschild, enough. Can you make it work? Honestly? I don't know. I think we can scrape by, and I suppose if we can't, it won't matter in the long run anyway. Then it's decided. Sarah, you take the pride and use the robot as support. Take our friend here and secure that purifier. Yes, sir. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that my father and I have been talking. The pride and I have decided that after all you've survived, you've done enough to be an honorary member of Lion's Pride. So congratulations. Membership comes with some privileges, including our power armor. You want the full suit or the recon armor? I don't really need either one, but I can repair my T-51B with the power armor. Sure thing. Hopefully, it'll give you a bit of an extra edge. Okay. So do you think you can hold it together for this? I don't know, Sarah. I'm not sure about this. I mean, I'm a pacifist. What's the point of me going with you? Couldn't I just wait until you secure the purifier and then come put in the code? Listen, you'll be fine. You just stay behind whoever's in front of you and keep your head down. We're burning daylight here. Are you ready to move out? I think I need another minute or two. Actually, a couple of hours. No more than a day, anyway. Hurry it up! Every minute you take is one more that we can't afford to spend. I've previously poked some gentle fun at quests that aren't as urgent as the game makes them sound, and it's not really fair to pick on Fallout 3 because countless other games do the same thing, but we're not actually on the clock at this point. You can go exploring, do side quests, take a vacation, come back after literally months of in-game time, and she'll still be standing there waiting to assault the purifier. And we're just barely over-encumbered, so if we wear the power armor, we'll be okay. I saved in Oasis last week to set up the joke in the intro this week, and forgot we still had all the loot from the Oasis caves. Which isn't why I told Sarah we need a minute, but it does let us kill two birds with one stone. If the Brotherhood expects Luz to join them on the front lines, she wants some military-grade backup with her. Which sadly means we need to dismiss dog meat. Wait a minute. No, it doesn't. He's the exception to the only one companion rule, which I should have remembered much earlier since I ran around with Dogmeat and Karen pretty much the entire Skills Dash series. In that case, come on, boy. RL3 is pleased to see you, sir. Is there a mission to undertake? Fortunately, our karma is still neutral. Time to head back into the fight, RL3. I should definitely say so. Time to roll out. Are you ready now? We can't afford to keep standing around like this. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Okay, don't be nervous. You'll have the whole pride backing you up, not to mention this giant tin can. Just stay safe until we reach the purifier. You're no good to us if you're dead. And don't let that thing step on you. All right, Rothschild, fire it up. Pride, move out! <laughs> Thank you. 
True story. The first time I ever played Fallout 3, I didn't notice Liberty Prime in all the times I visited the lab. Not even when Lyons and Rothschild had that extended conversation about it. It wasn't until the elevator started going up and he started talking that I realized the giant robot they kept referring to was right there in the room with us. It's just so big, I guess it seemed like it was part of the architecture or something, and I never really looked at it. Anyway, Liberty Prime only keeps moving forward as long as the player stays within a certain distance. It's a pretty generous distance, but if you get too far behind, he'll stop and wait for you to catch up. Or if you're really gung-ho and run forward to engage the Enclave troops before anybody else, and you get too far ahead, you'll have to go back to get him moving again. And the whole trip from the Citadel to Project Purity is notoriously glitchy. He can get stuck or fail to destroy the barriers, sometimes even if you stay close, and then you're screwed unless you use console commands or reload a save. So we'll try to keep him moving, but stay as far to the rear of the formation as we can. The good news is, despite this battle being the climax of the game, it's no problem for a no-kill run, because Liberty Prime and the Brotherhood will easily kill everything in the way without your help on any difficulty setting. I thought the Enclave Transponder might really screw up gameplay balance during this section, in which case I would have had to come up with some plausible excuse to disable it when Take It Back starts, but it doesn't really give you much of an advantage. If you're doing a no-kill run and you hang back from the action like this, there's not much chance you'll get shot anyway. Except by the artillery, which it does not protect you from. If you're just using the mod for the bug fixes, the only thing it buys you is one good attack against an unsuspecting target, after which they all aggro anyway. And if you still think that's too much of an advantage, you can always drop it or sell it. It does become problematic a bit later, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Ow. I think that was a car blowing up, which the transponder also does not protect you from. You can get so much loot from this trip. Even with high strength and the strong back perk, there's no way to carry it all, and loose has neither. If you don't mind the risk of having to reload a save because Liberty Prime might get stuck, we're still not on the clock. Grab as much as you can, run back until you're far enough away from any enemies to fast travel, and go sell it or stash it in a locker at your house. I'm not going to do that, but I am going to pick up the energy weapons. With high repair skill, combining them as you go would be a good strategy to save weight because they get disproportionately more valuable as they approach perfect condition, but Luce's repair skill is only in the 50s. However, Kasdan will give you 7 stim packs for a plasma rifle even if it's completely broken and has a book value of 0. Unfortunately, you can loot giblets because Liberty Prime's laser just annihilates everything it hits. So with low to medium repair skill, you're probably better off turning in a big pile of low condition energy weapons to him than combining them and selling them to somebody else. Especially if you just turn around and buy stim packs with the money like Luce has a habit of doing. Is he stuck already? No, there he goes. I always thought it was cool how Prime takes down the final barrier around the memorial building. The rest of them are pretty easy to circumvent. You can just walk around them. But this one is like, ah, that's why we needed the robot. Well, that and this fight would be a nightmare if he wasn't here. I'm kind of surprised nobody on Sarah's team died on the way. I usually can't keep them all alive even when I'm actually helping. We'll head into the memorial building after they mop up the last of the Enclave reinforcements, and that's when the real problem with the transponder reared its ugly head. There are several Enclave soldiers in the gift shop area. If it was just the Lone Wanderer, it seems reasonable that you might be able to bluff your way into the control room since you have a valid authentication code. You could maybe even convince them Sarah's a prisoner and you're taking her to be interrogated or something. And once you're there, there's a speech challenge to get Colonel Autumn to surrender. But if you failed that speech check or took a wrong turn in his dialogue and he said he was going to kill you, he still didn't attack. So let's step inside and we'll see how I fixed it. The Enclave IFF transponder you're carrying emits a sequence of urgent sounding beeps before an automated message begins. Warning, you are entering a total interdiction zone. Any personnel not explicitly authorized by the commanding officer in this zone will be treated as hostiles, regardless of rank insignia and verbal or electronic identification. 
which seemed like a fairly plausible way to nerf the transponder at this point so it doesn't break the game. Now, Sarah's marked as essential, so she can't die, but if you're doing a no-kill run and it's just you and her, the results can be kind of comical. She's seriously outnumbered, so she keeps getting knocked unconscious, and as long as you stay hidden, the Enclave troops sound the all-clear and go back to whatever they were doing. Then she wakes up, takes a few more shots until they put her down again, rinse and repeat until they're all dead. Hopefully with Dogmeat and RL3 backing her up, this won't take forever. With the Deathclaw armor, Dogmeat's also essential, but RL3 isn't, so we need to keep an eye on him. If you've played this game before, you know the meta reason I brought him along, and it wasn't just for extra firepower in this part. And even though Dogmeat's essential, we do want to keep him up and fighting. His bite damage is too low to have any real effect on people in power armor, but he can keep him distracted while Sarah and RL3 pound on him. Hold still, boy. Have a stim pack. Okay, carry on. Okay, guys, that message on the transponder implied there's a commanding officer on site. Hold your fire and let me do all the talking. Just let me put on my most persuasive outfit. Perfect. Now, let's go see who's in charge. You again. I can't say I'm surprised. You and your ilk seem hell-bent on destroying everything our government has worked to achieve. There's nothing to stop me from killing you this time. Let's end this. I don't want to fight, but if you suspect he'll only respect strength, you're completely correct. And Luz knows him well enough at this point to understand that. Give it up, Autumn. You've lost. I beg to differ. The Enclave is at the height of its power. Once this facility is operational, the masses will flock to the Enclave for fresh water, protection, and a plan for the future. If you convinced Eden to self-destruct, you'd also have an option to remind him that his headquarters is destroyed, which is a less difficult speech check, but we didn't, so this is the only choice. And sadly, there's no Black Widow option, but they can't take away my head cannon. Why are you doing this? give your allegiance to a machine. Don't you prefer real flesh and blood? I am sworn to protect the presidency. The chain of command must be upheld. I wouldn't expect you to understand. And if we hadn't given Elder Lions the FEV, we'd have another speech check to use that to convince Autumn that Eden betrayed him. But we did, so we don't. Fortunately, we have high intelligence. I think it has to be nine for this. Otherwise, we'd have no choice but to fight him. Eden's not the president. He was never elected. Hell, he's not even human. And your point? My point is that your government isn't legitimate. You have no right to rule. I see. And what of the chain of command? When the Enclave fell on the West Coast, Eden was next in line for leadership. He's not human. He assumed control. It was never given to him. Yes, you're right. I had not considered it from that viewpoint. But then, where does that leave me? Just walk away. It's not too late. And you? You would just let me leave? How can I be sure you won't just shoot me once I turn my back on you? I suppose it doesn't matter much now. Very well. I shall leave you to your fate. You're just gonna let him leave like that? I'll go along with it, but I don't like it. Let's get this room secured and we'll call in the team. Dr. Lee, it's Sarah Lyons. I'm in the control room. We're both here. What's going on? I've been monitoring the equipment remotely and we have a serious problem. The facility has been damaged during the fighting. Some of it looks accidental, some of it may have been sabotage. There's pressure building up in the holding tanks. It needs to be released now, or else the whole facility could explode. To release the pressure, you're going to have to turn the purifier on. Do you understand me? It has to be turned on now. If I'm reading this right, I'm afraid there are lethal levels of radiation inside the chamber. I'm sorry. 
I wish there was some other way, but there's just no time. It has to be done now, or the damage will be catastrophic. Well, so much for celebrating. One of us is going to have to go in there and turn the damn thing on. And whoever does it isn't coming back out. Not exactly how I imagined going out, you know? So, what should we do? Draw straws? Or we could send my robot. You know, the only one of us in the room who's immune to radiation. If that'll work, then great. But we have to do this quickly. And this is one of the rare times in the game when you are on the clock. A timer starts when you finish that conversation, and if somebody doesn't start the purifier within three minutes, it really does blow up and kill you. The timer doesn't run while you're in a menu, like if you have your Pip-Boy up or you're in a conversation, so we better talk to RL3. This is where the hard decisions are made, soldier. Where history is written. Everybody probably knows this, but it wasn't until the Broken Steel DLC came out that you had this option. In the base game, once you or Sarah start the purifier, it's game over. Literally, I mean, you couldn't play past the ending. You went back to the main menu, load a save, or start a new game. And you didn't have the option to tell Sarah you were going to send one of your followers in. You could say, let me think about it, and then ask them, but they all refused, with varying degrees of plausibility. From the perfectly reasonable hell no from characters like Clover or Butch to the completely absurd no, I can't deprive you of your destiny that you get from Fox. But if you have Broken Steel installed, which I obviously do, the characters with reasonable objections still refuse, but the three who are immune to radiation will agree, with different levels of enthusiasm. Karen grumbles about it. Fox acknowledges that it's logical, but RL3 is his usual gung-ho self. Emergency Directive. Get that purifier running on the double. Code 216. Sir, yes sir. My superior construction and programming will outlast your frail human form in that hostile environment. It'll be a battlefield commendation for sure. Cycle that airlock, soldier, and we'll put an end to this. If you're still there, the purifier needs to be activated now. You don't have much time left. You can stand a little farther away from the switch and still activate it without taking any rads, but it really doesn't matter unless you're heavily irradiated when you cycle the airlock. I don't know what happens if you die of radiation poisoning in the middle of this cutscene. Probably just loads the autosave when you enter the rotunda, but I've never actually done it. And now we fade to white and get the ending slideshow. And so it was that the lone wanderer ventured forth from Vault 101, intent on discovering the fate of a father who had once sacrificed the future of humanity for that of his only child. The Capital Wasteland proved a cruel, inhospitable place. Thankfully, when selected by the sinister president to be his instrument of annihilation, the Wanderer refused. Humanity, with all its flaws, was deemed worthy of preservation. The waters of life flowed at last, free and pure for any and all. The capital wasteland, at long last, was saved. So ends the story of the Lone Wanderer, who stepped through the great door of Vault 101 and into the annals of legend. But the tale of humanity will never come to a close, for the struggle of survival is a war without end. And war... War never changes. I'm amused by how short the slideshow is if your karma is neutral. If you're good or evil, there's fairly complicated logic that plays different narration and shows different pictures based on things you've done in the game. But if you're neutral, you don't get any of it, even if you've done those same things. 
I'm not sure if it's a punishment, a reward, or the designers just never expected anybody to make it through the whole game with neutral karma. Careful now, careful. Don't move too quickly. Everything's fine, you're safe. You're in the Citadel. I was starting to think you might never wake up, despite assurances to the contrary. I've been coming down here every day to see both you and my daughter. It's good that at least one of you has recovered. And despite the eulogistic tone of the slideshow, we're still alive. One of the criticisms I heard when this DLC came out was that it undermined the game's theme of sacrifice. And I do think it could have maintained the gravitas of the decision by keeping the game over condition if you sacrifice yourself. But otherwise, I don't agree with that criticism. If you let Sarah do it, Ron Perlman mocks your cowardice in the slideshow, and the Brotherhood isn't quite as deferential to you going forward. It's entirely up to you whether the Lone Wanderer feels crippling survivor's guilt or just shrugs and says, well, she was a professional soldier. Sacrificing herself if necessary was literally in her job description. Plenty of room for introspection there. I think it enhances rather than detracts from the theme of sacrifice. But in the follower scenario, the base game already undermined itself. If you're going to make a game about sacrifice and have the inescapable doom at the end be radiation, don't give me companions who are immune to radiation. I found that to be a much more glaring problem than the DLC letting you live through it. The first time I played Fallout 3, I was livid because Fox was right there. Anyway, let's finish this conversation so I can wrap up. What happened? How did I get here? Please, relax. Everything is fine. You were brought back to the Citadel after some sort of energy spike in the purifier. You and Sarah were both knocked unconscious. Quite a bit has happened since then. Wow. Well, thanks for taking care of me. I'm out. I wonder if you might be willing to aid us a bit further. While we've had a decisive victory, the Enclave threat hasn't been removed yet. No thanks. I've had enough of this. That's a shame. We could use your assistance. And since you have done so much to aid our cause and proven yourself more than capable, you have been named a Knight of the Brotherhood of Steel. Should you change your mind, Scry Rothschild can brief you on what's been going on these last few weeks. And I was not expecting to level up, so bear with me. It doesn't really matter unless I do a no-kill mod for the DLC someday, but put it all in repair and we'll finally be able to get our equipment to an even better condition than Wolfgang. Now the perk. Well, I've been talking about light steps since episode one, so let's bring it full circle. And here's RL3, no worse for the wear. RL3 is ready for another tour of duty, sir. Soldier, not only do you deserve a battlefield commendation, but some R&R &R as well. Why don't you head back to Canterbury Commons? Dog meat. Come on, boy. Let's get going. How does all the squirrels you could ever chase sound? The thing about my Pip-Boy is, A, I literally can't take it off, and B, Harold doesn't have a problem with it. The whole forsake technological conveniences thing is all birch. I'm not saying we need a mainframe by the pavilion and a reactor out back, but how can you not think an infirmary unit is something worth having, right? And it wouldn't hurt to... Oh. Okay. Well, I'll talk to you later then. All right, let's have a look at the Pip-Boy. And there we have it. Fallout 3 base game complete with people killed and creatures killed both at zero. There's not much to show you in the GEC today, so if you usually bail out when I start talking about technical stuff, just bear with me or skip forward a minute or two, because right after that, I'll wrap up with a few thoughts I had about the series as a whole. Nothing too surprising here. There's a trigger zone inside the Jefferson Memorial entrance. Unless the player is the one entering the trigger and take it back is at the stage where the objective is to reach the control room, it doesn't do anything. If those conditions are met, it checks if the player has the transponder. 
If so, it shows the message, replaces the working transponder with an inert version, which is an exact copy of the working version, except it doesn't have an object script, starts the transponder return quest, and sets the faction relationship between the player and the Enclave back to normal. It needs to do that because an object script's on drop block isn't called if the object is removed by another script, so the code in the transponder script that would ordinarily reset the faction relation if the player drops, sells, or puts it in a container doesn't run when the trigger removes it. Then either way, the trigger deletes itself. The transponder return quest script just waits for the quest stage to indicate that the control room has been secured and then removes the inert transponder and returns the working one. Which doesn't matter unless you have broken steel installed, but if you do, it lets you keep the benefit of not having to dodge enclave outposts every 10 feet when you're exploring the wasteland after take it back is over. Oh, and the extra parameter after the item count in the remove item and add item commands is just a flag that suppresses notifications, so the player doesn't see any confusing transponder remove, transponder added messages when it happens. And that's it for the technical stuff. So, it turns out the only feature I technically had to put in the mod was from episode 1, letting you end the tutorial without killing the rad roach. After that, we could have finished the main quest with a bit of metagaming, letting companions kill the super mutants in the Jefferson Memorial, that kind of thing, but it would have been a real grind, and there would have been some side quests that we just couldn't complete, like having to kill the nest guardians for Lesko. Besides, if I just called it done after bypassing the tutorial roach, where's the fun in that? I wanted to give a special thanks to everyone who left comments and suggestions. When I first had the idea of doing a series about making a mod, two main things appealed to me. First, there was a trend in a lot of my previous videos that people were really interested when I talked about behind the scenes stuff, so I thought it would be really popular. Which, if you only look at the number of views, it actually wasn't, but the people who did watch were really engaged. Which was awesome, because the other thing that appealed to me about the idea was that it could become an iterative, collaborative development effort. And that, it most definitely was. There were a ton of great suggestions from the comments that made it into the mod. So, thank you. I've seen mixed opinions about some of the quality of life features, especially the taser fist, but also things like the transponder and buzz off. If I was doing a no-kill challenge run, I definitely wouldn't have used any of that, but I was more interested in the role-playing angle. And I don't mean to sound like a lazy dick, but if you think any of those features are overpowered, don't use them. I'm not going to make them configurable, because I am a lazy dick. And speaking of my personality flaws, I said in one of the early episodes that I was going to try getting outside my stealth and mobility comfort zone and relying more on damage resistance, but by about halfway through, even though I had the best power armor in the game, I was back to sneaking full-time and only using the T-51B in emergencies. So, epic fail there. I always have mixed feelings at the end of a long series like this. A little bit sad, because it was a lot of fun, and now it's over. A little bit relieved, because I impose schedules and deadlines on myself even for passion projects, and it feels like, now I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. Which is kind of dumb, because I was doing what I wanted to do, and nobody was standing over me saying, make an episode this week or you're fired! But more than anything, I'm always excited, because soon it's on to the next project. I'm not going to drag this video out any longer, but I'll do a channel update in the near future to let you know what I'll be working on next. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe if you haven't already, feel free to leave a comment before you go, and I'll see you then.